O Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. June and still some rain. Water is amazing. It's central to our lives. Our, our bodies are, what, 90% plus water? About that? We rely on it for every major aspect of our survival. We drink it, we wash with it, we cook with it. It's infinitely malleable. It can be solid, liquid, gas. Truly remarkable. It's no wonder water plays a, a central role in so many religious rituals. You know, it's, it's elemental to life. And yet water, for all of its softness and malleability and tastiness, is one of the most powerful and potentially destructive forces on the planet. A steady light rain like this morning can do wonders for the growth of fruits and vegetables in our orchard, for example. And they all sustain life, but in torrents, it can wash life away. How many of you have ever hiked any of the slot canyons in the southwest, Utah or Arizona? Right? And if you have walked through these canyons, hundreds of feet high but really narrow, you can see these boulders and these, you know, huge uh, uh, tree trunks, like wedged in between the rocks, like 50, 70 feet up and above your head. Water did that. It's truly breathtaking. I was, I was watching a video of the flooding that has swept across the southern Ukraine in the aftermath of the bombing of the Kakova Dam this past week. And the images brought back memories of other floods that have decimated communities around the world, like the, the horrific damage in Pakistan and, uh, last year, or the, or the towns ravaged in Kentucky by the, those floods. And of course, you know, who can forget the images of the tsunami some, what, 20 years ago now that wiped away hundreds of thousands of lives throughout South Asia. And perhaps it's this, it's this dichotomy that connects water and faith so vividly in my mind, because vibrant faith is truly remarkable at well, as well. I mean, it can inspire acts of heroism and selflessness and compassion. And it amazes me how many seemingly immovable obstacles are swept away when, when Deep faith is unleashed. You know, we, we meet Abram at the age of 75, who at the prompting of a hitherto unknown God's voice, picked up, left all familiarity and safety behind, traveled hundreds of miles to an unknown land, and he had no offspring, a, a barren wife, and nevertheless he trusted God's promise that he would create a great nation through him. And most importantly, that he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Now, mind you, the Lord didn't say anything about power and worldly riches. Right? His promise was that he and his faithful followers would be blessings. But like water, the unbridled power of, well, Faith, for lack of a better word, can also be pernicious. As the great Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw once authored, you cannot have power for good without having power for evil too. Even mother's milk nourishes murderers as well as heroes. It all comes down to how our faith is incarnated. 
When faith turns in on itself and becomes an excuse for self-aggrandizement or domination of rather than righteousness in service of God's creation, it ceases to be faith. If our faith is insecure, that's when we need to take control and impose our will on the faith lives of others and prove ourselves right instead of living as, as witnesses to the unbridled love of God, which is what truly makes us a blessing to all the families of the earth. The faithful relationship that the ancient Jews had with their God came long before any of the ritual purity laws unfolded, as we see in Abram's story. Those, those religious laws came about much later uh, under Moses, because God's people struggled and failed over and over to sustain the faith which should have been inscribed in their hearts. And they thought that these divine laws would save them from their worst selves. They were meant to be their spiritual workouts to enrich their divine connection, but the sad and ironic outcome was that those laws became a means by which some people in the community, especially those with the financial means to fulfill their onerous expectations, established hierarchies and dominance over rather than communion with their neighbors. In other words, their, their rabid faith had ceased to be the blessing that God intended. This Sunday, there is a, a concerted effort in many churches around the nation to shine a light on the growing threat of what's called Christian nationalism. It's a movement that has captivated many, mostly white evangelical churches in this country, and in others as well. And through this marriage of religion and identity politics, Christian nationalism seeks to establish the cultural hegemony of a particular strain of traditionalist Christian laws and practices that it perceives as foundational to their American identity. The enforcement and triumph of those laws are considered essential in their spiritual warfare against perceived, well, godless liberalism uh, for a better term. But the consequence of this movement has been that it has shown the utter fear and weakness of the faith they claim to uphold. Terrified of losing their history of privilege and pre preeminence, like the Jewish temple elites of Jesus' day, they have sought to use law and doctrine to draw sharp lines around who belongs and who doesn't. Who is truly American and who isn't? And there's no shortage of opportunists out there ready and willing to manipulate our fears to amass power for themselves. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, wrote to a community that was beleaguered, um, of beleaguered believers in the heart of the Gentile world. They were mostly Gentiles themselves, but many were also Diaspora Jews. And Paul knew the truth about the perversion of faith by obsession with the law because he had been one of its worst offenders, right? Hunting and persecuting those whose love of God in Christ had triumphed over their concern for the minutiae of the Jewish purity laws. And not only did the Roman converts need to know that ritual Jewishness was not a prerequisite for their spiritual inclusion in the community of faith, but so did their Jewish companions. After all, Abram was blessed for his faithfulness long before those laws that had ever been written. Paul, in his efforts to share the gospel with the wider world, and universalize the promise of belonging was essentially preaching the exact opposite of 
Christian or Jewish nationalism. Our problem today is not equity, diversity, and inclusion and the dilution of some America, idealized American narrative. The only enemy we need to overcome is the deluge of our own fear because that's what fundamentally separates us from God and one another and prevents us from becoming blessings. The gospel writer we know as Matthew is often identified with the tax collector in, who's the subject of today's gospel story and who was an eventual, uh, eventual disciple of Jesus. And scholars have determined that the gospeler we call Matthew wrote during the last quarter of the first century, an era in which the Gentile embrace of the faith was eclipsing its Jewish roots. And intra-Jewish conflicts were growing more acute as the fears of Roman retaliation against Jewish nationalism increased. So Matthew was concerned with maintaining the beauty and importance of the community's uh, Jewish roots um, while asserting that God and Christ could enable all members of the community to flourish. And to do that, he too had to elevate faith over law without totally dissing his Jewish legal history. So, so we read a passage today that, that contains this steady stream of, uh, a, a steady stream of strong but gentle examples of faith that resulted in the blessings that God intends for us all, even as Jewish purity laws were being challenged. And the first powerful expression was the calling of Matthew himself. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. That's it. I mean, that was really bold. I mean, after all, he was a tax collector, a collaborator. He was hated. Associating with him was the surest way for Jesus to tank his own reputation. And nevertheless, Jesus invited Matthew and others like him to join him for dinner. Jesus didn't need to condemn or convince him. We heard nothing of attempts to make Matthew repent. When confronted by the ultra-religious nationalists over his, this behavior, what was Jesus' response? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Because that's what the ritual purity laws were doing, sacrificing the lives of the sick and the oppressed. And no sooner could we say, mic drop, right? One of the leaders of the synagogue, someone from the opposite side of the moral spectrum, knelt before Jesus and said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Touching a dead body? Impure. But his, his faith enabled him to break with his colleagues, probably at great personal cost. And while they're on their way to her, an unclean woman, hemorrhaging for 12 years, out of pure faith, touched Jesus' cloak, convinced that the, that act alone had the power to heal her. Then arriving at the faithful Pharisee's house, people were laughed at him because, for saying that the girl lived, and nevertheless he went in, took her by the hand, and raised her up. So in this short passage, Jesus breaks three religious laws in the name of healing and wholeness. And again, there were no rants. You didn't have to convince anybody. There was no condemnation. There was no sermon or condition that Jesus imposed. Faith didn't need to be coerced. Its evangelical power was in its simplicity and in its service of healing. That's the faith that we're called to incarnate. 
We don't need an apologetic. We don't need to win any arguments or battles out there. We don't need to mold others in our own image and conform them to our beliefs, nor flood the airwaves with our presumed righteousness. We don't need to drag believe unbelievers to Jesus' feet or cast the heathen into the pits of hell. That's not our job. Our job is to be a blessing. Our job is to be a blessing like the gentle rain that nourishes a spring of living water that quenches the parched throats of our neighbors. That is the truly evangelical life. That is how we incarnate our faith. And the report of this will spread throughout the nation. Thanks be to God. Amen.